Hi, welcome to Golang. This is Security Simplified, section 24 in the Go on the Run series. And today we're in part five and we're gonna be talking about hashing. But before we jump into the code and slides and so on, um, just a little bit housekeeping. If you aren't subscribed, hit that subscribe button, thumbs up the video, uh, let me know that how you're out there, you're enjoying it. Um, so let's get into it. So the easiest way I think to cover this material is forced by starting off with a simple example that you can understand and then going from there. So let's jump to the code and then we're going to come back to some slides. So here I am at the prompt and if we look, we can see our previous um, directories. Let's make a directory for Ashen. Now that I have my directory, I'm going to start up Visual Studio Code. And we'll start with our very first example. Now to keep things simple, usually I would create a CMD command directory, but I don't want to, because I'm going to be changing and running things from the command line often, um, just to simplify things, I'm just going to keep our main that go in the, in the example directory and not create a CMD subdirectory within our example directory. But let's get our modules file going. Now we're doing security, so let's just call it that. All right, we want this to be outside, not part of our example. And then let's get our main that go. All right, so what is the first thing we want to do? Now, of course, we need to have a func main. And that looks like that. But let's say that I have a few names. Now I'm going to pronounce the names of some countries here and we will use that for a set of strings that we have. Now, what is Ashen? Well, let's just say that Ashen is a way of turning text into some numeric representation or another set of text that represent the original string. Now that might seem a bit circular. So let me try and say that another way. When you hash something, you take the text that you have and you want a representation of that. It doesn't necessarily look the same. It's not encoding, it's not encryption, but you want it to be able to represent that original text. And usually the hash value is going to be of a fixed length. Now all this still probably have you confused. So let's continue and write, add a bit more code. So in this example, what I'm gonna do is loop over each one of the string values I have. So I'm going to say four, I'm gonna ignore the index and V is gonna be the value. So it's gonna get the, the string Diana, then United States, then Canada. And so I range over those names and then I am going to send that to my hash function. Okay, and so you see I printed out the value and then the hash function. So what does that hash function look like? So if I write a very simple hash function here, and what this function is doing is it takes a string and returns an integer. In this case, it's an integer. Later on, we can see how you can return a hash that's a string also. But in this case, I want to return an integer. So I'm hashing string two ints. And what I do is I have this integer variable v, and I simply loop over every character in that string. When I range over a string, I essentially get a rune back, which represents the encoding of that character. Because I want to return an int value, and a rune is not an int, I cast it to an int and then I just simply append it. So if you've never seen this before, what this really means is simply v is equals to v plus int b. So whatever value is on this side, you simply can simplify it to mean add whatever is on this right side to v and then put it back in v. So that's exactly what this means. So this is a very simple hashing function, right? You can see I'm just literally summing up <laughs> the numeric value of each one of these characters. So I'm taking a sum really of each one of these strings. 
And that's a simple way I can turn a string into or have a numerical representation for the string. And as you could see, there are different characters here. So you can imagine that I should get different value, right? Different numeric value. So let's run this and see. So if I run this, I see that Guyana hashes to the number 613, United States to 1277, and Canada to the number 568. So in a way, you can say that with this action algorithm, if for whatever reason, I want to store this in an array and do a quick lookup, I can then just quickly put like 613 at some offset in an array or something, and then that could be a sort of stand-in for Guyana, okay? Now, you don't want to take this too far, but for now, we're going to say that oh, since Guyana hashes to this value, 613, I can use 613 if that's what I want to do in my like, program to be a stand-in for Guyana, and that can allow me to quickly look up Guyana when I want it by saying, okay, let's look up which string represents um, hash to 613, right? And notice I took a much longer string and just turned that into some number. But the way I do it is just by adding up all the, the numeric value for each character. Okay, so I want to now change this example so we don't have to, we can feed any string we want from the keyboard, right? So standard in. So let's create another example and we'll modify this code slightly. So let's do, this is example two. Let's copy it, paste it. We call this example two. And what I'll do is close that. Let's clean this up and close this. And what I want to do this time is instead create a variable here to hold a value that I read from the user. So I'm going to say var v is a string because I no longer I'm going to be looping over value in a slice and then I want to read it from the input. So one way to do that is to simply say let's create a scanner buff IO new scanner that is tied to the standard input and then I will loop over I'll use the scanner to constantly check if I have a new value. So when I say scanner.scan, this function checks standard in to see if there's a string, reads it, and if it is, it returns Boolean value saying, yes, I got a string or not. So if I do that, you'll see it says, advances the scanner to the next token, which will then be available through the bytes or text message. And returns Boolean to say, yep, it's okay, I was able to scan something. But if not, there was an error, then it would return false. So by me just sitting on this for loop, I could read multiple lines of input. And so once I scan something, like it said just now, once you do a scan, the value is available as scanner.bytes or scanner.txt. If I do scanner.txt, well, it just returns the text. Okay. And now I can use V, pass it into my hash function. And this is all I need. This is the only transformation I need. Those three lines of code or whatever I added to say, oh, no, I'm going to read from standard A. So now let's go to example two on the command line. So if I go to example two and then I do go run, for example, and I run what's in this directory. Notice it's sitting there waiting for a value. So I can type the same thing, Guyana. I get 613. Notice it just prints back out the value. And just as before, and Canada, and I get the 568. And I could type my name, for example, and see what that hash is to. Um, hello world, right? And see what that hash to. And so I could type multi word strings here, and those work just as fine. Okay, so this seemed to work, and I could type Control C to end that program. One of the things I did was, let's say I wanted to get a list of countries. So if you go to your search engine and you type in list of countries, um, for example, when I did this in Google, I got list of countries back um, from worldmeters.info. And I clicked on it and downloaded the list, um, highlighted the list of countries here, and just save it. 
So once I copy the list of countries, I can create a text file for it. So I call it countries add comma separated value. Uh, you don't have to name it that, but countries that text work fine. But by calling it comma separated value here in my Visual Studio code, and I have the comma separate value um, color highlighter, you can see that how it highlights those values for me. Now, I really just want the countries without any of the other information like the population and whatever other information that rep represent. I don't care about all that. And I certainly don't want this number here to say which country it is, right? So it's, it's one, da, da, da. So this came directly from that website. So after a little bit of manipulation in, on my command line, I can then take this result and create a new file called countries.txt and simply list the country the country names without all the other information so now i have my list of countries in a text file now we know from before that once we have a program that can read from the standard in we can feed it input so we have a couple ways of doing that we can say cat countries and let's go back up all right maybe we should build go build and so have an executable, all right? And so if we go back up and we do cat countries txt, that's our result there. And we can feed this as input by piping it to our example We can feed this as input to our example2 that example2 program. And if we do like this, you can see now that of each one of the countries, um, we have a corresponding numeric value. Now, what this doesn't tell us is if they are duplicates, because there's so many countries, it doesn't tell us they're, if they're duplicates. So what we can do then is pipe this result. Unix is really cool. We can pipe this result to a sort utility that comes with, on most Unix system. And I can say I want to sort it by column two, the second column, and then column one. Now, I really don't have to sort by column one next, but actually that's column two is the only thing I care about. And so now when I sort by column two, um, you can see we have something that looks like this. And so if we scroll back up and look to see if we have any duplicates, it might be a little bit hard to do this with your eyes to just look and see if you have duplicates. But so we have 400, 418, 19, 26, 431, 44, 511. 17 27 look at that we have a duplicate here which means that haiti hash to the same value as malta notice these are two different strings but they hash to the same value and we have the same thing with libya and samoa right so you can run into this sort of issue when you do hash it and same thing with qatar and tonga right and you could go through and you can see spain sudan they all even though very different correct set of characters they somehow resulted in, because of the hashing function that we wrote, not a very good hashing function, but this is called a collision. When two different um, values input sort of result in the same output when you're hashing. And so we can see it here with Belize, and Malawi, and blah, blah, blah. You could go through the list and you can see Jordan, Poland, you know, there are many of them that, so we didn't write a very, very good hashing function. So this is what happened. All right. so. That's one of the problems that you can encounter when you hash. So if I wanted to use these numbers as some way of doing a lookup, I have to make sure that I can account to the fact that multiple values could hash to the same thing. And so wherever I'm storing them, I have to store those multiple values so that I'll, when I do find the location, so if I say I'm looking for things that have 531, maybe there are two or three values there that it gets me quickly to the location that I need to look but then I only have two or three values to now search through as opposed to searching through a hundred and something. So I don't know how long this file is, but let's see countries.txt. And so there are 194 countries. And so just by simply typing in like whatever the hash value is, you know, 231, for example, I can have a search program that simply go look up that value very, very quickly. All right. So that's one way you can write a very simple hash function. So we could make our hash function slightly better. And one way to do that is to simply use a different type of operation. So for example, if we copy this example and paste it again, and we call this 
example three, we can simply, uh, let me get rid of the executable. We don't need this. And similarly, maybe we just get rid of this so we don't commit it to our repository. All right. So if we go to our example now, let's close this. What we can do with our hash function is simply change it to do a exclusive or operation. Instead of adding, we can do exclusive or, and then um, let's rerun this now and see. Oh, by the way, before I leave here, let's find another simpler way of seeing if we have duplicates. So which directory are we in? So we're in hashing directory, let's cd into exercise two, and let's do go run. Um, main, for example, and let's feed it the countries list, countries.txt, and it works the exact same way. But I can do a little bit of Kung Fu on the command line here by simply saying that I want um, to use awk, this program, and let it gives me, let tell it that I want the second print out, the second field. By default, awk would split these by spaces and I want the last field. Well, actually, since there are some words, some countries there that have multiple words like the United States, it's some of them is going to give me the number and then it's going to give me the second word in that country's name for countries with multiple name, uh, words in their name. So I just want to do a number of fields. If you don't know awk, don't worry about it. Um, and so this should just give me all numbers only. What I can do now is um, pipe it to sort and then if I sort it, now I can say, and as you can see here, I have two values that are same and so on, but I can also count them. So I can also say something like um, sort and then unique, and unique will remove duplicates, and sort minus u would do the same thing too, but I want unique to be able to do a count. So I can say do unique and then count. And then notice how, but since I counted, you can see here is that 968 that we had a duplicate just now, and then there's this 761 that's occurred three times. And I could pipe this result back to sort. I know it's kind of crazy. And we can see that all, um, 735 appeared four times and blah, 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 blah. And then we had a bunch of unique um, ones that were unique. But we do have a number that were at least duplicated and about three of them that occur three times and then one that occurred as one, money as four times. Right now, we don't care which countries they are, they, these represented. All we want to know is to see if we have duplicates or not. Okay. And so of out of the um, 194 countries, well, we're sort of down to 163, right? Because we, we had some collision. All right. So the reason why I'm going through all this is because I want to prepare us for our third example. So let's go to our third example now. So we go up and then go to example three directory. And let's rerun the same exact code. I haven't changed anything. The only thing I change is in the code, I'm using um, a different operation. Instead of addition, I'm using um, exclusive R. And you could find a number of different ways to write hash function. And you'd have to take a whole university course on what are the, how to write really good ones and maybe some books. But let's run this again. And now, as you can see, our hashing function is actually worse, right? We only have 69 unique values, right? That's because we know it's how when we have a collision, um, we're doing a sort on it. And we can see here, we could see it. Oh, yeah, it's actually worse. Um, we have some much smaller values and we have a way more collision than before. But we can start playing around with, you know, is there's other ways in which we can compute an integer number. So let's try yet another way of computing an integer number. Before we write another hash function in example four, let's go back to our slides. So this is where we left off. And what I wanna do is talk about the shift operator. Now, before we talk about a few other operators like the not operator, the and operator, or operator, and then of course the exclusive or operator, which we have used quite a bit so far. And we just use it in a hashing function. We say, well, it didn't operate well, it did not work out so well. So I want to introduce you to another operator called a shift operator, and actually shift operators. We'll see why. So imagine that I have six bits, and those bits are represented here as 
you know, dash, 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 meaning that all, those are three bits. I do not care what their values are. I don't care if it's zeros and one, blah, 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 right? So it could be anything. I don't care what they are. So I put dashes there. But I do care about the last three bits, which I'm going to call bit X, bit Y, and bit Z. And this is going to be an input. This is going to be my input to my left shift operator. Now, again, if it's the first time you, you having to do this, don't worry about it. So this is what a left shift operator looks like. You have a double left less than sign together, and that's the left shift operator. And so what this means is that when I apply the left shift operator to my input here, what I get as the output is that my bits were shifted to the left. Okay. You might hear people say it's shifted up, right? Left being up. And why that is, is if you look now, my three bits moved up by two. So in this example, I shift by two. Now the left shift operator is always going to take a number of how many, how many places you want to shift your bits. But here I didn't show that, but I'm going to tell you that it's two. And we can see it's two because I had three don't care bits up front, which are bits I didn't care about. I, that's why I don't care if they got replaced. And I shift out by two. So I only have one don't care bit. But notice what happened to the right of my value. The right side of my value, I shifted in two, um, two bits. And those were zeros. So this is how the left shift operator is going to, is going to behave is when you shift bits upwards. Well, on the right hand side, it fills it in with zero. So in this case, I shift it up by two bits. So it puts in two zeros on the right hand side. Take a minute to really digest this. And hopefully I explain it well enough that if you don't get it, you can just replay this exact same section and hopefully you get it. Now, if there's a left shift, there's also a right shift. And so in this example, I have six bits again. I care about the upper three bits. I do not care what values um, the lower three bits have, right? Remember, it's bits. So each one of those positions are going to be either zero or a one, but I don't care what they are. I only care about my upper three bits, X, Y, and Z. And so I'm going to do a right shift. And so right shift look like this, two greater than signs together. And my output is going to look like this for now. It's going to be, I shifted two bits in place because again, I'm shifting to the right by two. So I shifted down. And so I substitute on the left hand side of my values, two zeros. And then of course, um, since I had to shift over to the right by two, well, I only have one don't care bit now. Please stop, steer this as long as you need to, to make sure this makes sense. So hopefully that was pretty straightforward after much staring at it. And now for the gotcha with right shift. And so here I'm going to assume that I have eight bits. And that is because as we know, when you group bits in a computer, there's only so many you can group together. Eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, right? So you can actually group six like I was showing before, but that was just to make that example a little bit easier to sort of look at the bits moving around. But let's just say I have an eight bit value and that value, the most significant bit, which is our leftmost bit, bit or leftmost bit is zero. And so then I'm still interested in the X, Y, and Z bits, right? So if my most significant bit is bit zero, then I'm interested in bit one, two, and three. And then the lower four bits, I do not really care about those, what values they have. So I'm going to put it into a right shift operator and the output I'm going to get, let's say I shifted over once I'm this time I'm shifting down by one. And so what I have is zero, zero, because remember there was a zero there previously. I puts in a zero, right? To occupy the space that is now um, left when I shift down by one. And of course, now I've taken up one of those um, lower four bits. And so now I only have three don't care bits. Again, stare at this, stare at it, stare at it, replay it as many times to make sense. Now, here's another example why this is a got you with the right shift. If I still have an 8-bit value, but this time notice that my most significant bit is a 1. Now, most of the time when this happens, if your, your number rep, if the bits represent a number, once the most significant bit is a 1, that means it's a negative number. 
if it's just a character or something, well then don't count on anything, okay? But one being in the most significant bits would say that oh, this number is a negative number. And we'll get back to that later why that is important. But now when I put this into my right shift, and again, I'm just shifting down by one, what happens is it shifts back, it puts a one in that position. And this is why I said there's a gotcha because if there was a zero, it puts zero when you shift down. If there was a one, it put one. When you do left shift, you never have to worry about this. It always puts zero in that position. If the least significant bit, which is gonna be my rightmost bit was a one and I shift up, it just puts a zero, it doesn't matter. So only the right shift had this set of gotcha that you want to be aware of. All right, so let's do a quick revision of binary numbers at a glance, okay? So here I have bits, and so I have the least amount of bits I need to represent values. So if I have one bit, remember that one bit can have the value zero or one, and so that allows me to represent two possible things. And I could see with a one bit value, I could represent two possible things because I have two red brown boxes like rust color boxes there. If I have two bits, I can represent of the four possible things. And as we can see with the orange there, um, burnt orange maybe, there are four possible values that I can represent, right? And notice every time I add a bit, the number of things that I can represent double. Now, the last example is, let's say I have three bits, now I can represent eight possible things. And again, we can see that from the green, and I added one more bit from the time I had two, and again, I double from four to eight. So every time I add a bit, I multiply by two. And you could go in the reverse. You can imagine that every time I remove a bit, I half, right? Good. So bit shifting is a way of doing multiplication and division. And basically, that's what the computer does. We do multiply and divide. All right, so now that we have that in mind with bits and how many, and every time you add one, you multiply, if you remove a bit, you half. Now we could kind of look at some examples of shifting. And so let's say that I have this eight bit value and I put a dash in between each four, each nibble to just sort of make it easier to read. And in parentheses, I put the decimal value. And so the input there is the number one represented as an eight bit value. And since it's positive, positive, positive one, um, the uppermost or the most significant bit is zero. And so let's do, say I do a left shift. It means that I'm adding a zero in the least significant position. So that's a multiply. And so now we can see the output is my one was shifted up one place. And so that gives me Two. And you can notice the equation there, how you use this, is you have a value on the left, the left shift operator, and how many bits I should shift this, or how many places I should shift this. In this case, it's one. And so the result there is two. And so that's a multiply. I add one, I multiply that, when I shift it all by one, and that's two. If I have five represented as in binary, this is what it looks like. It looks like zero, one, zero, one. And of course, the upper four nibbles are zero. And if I shift up by one again, we know this should be 10. And again, our output is going to be 1010, which is the binary representation for 10. You can check this on any calculator or your website. And the equation is just five shifted up, left shift by one, and the result is two. So again, proving that every time you shift up by one bit, you double in that value, whatever the value is, always multiplying by two. Now, if we shift in down, we said, oh, remember that was a divide, divide by two, you're half it. So, but this, we don't have any place of fraction here. So it's just gonna be a whole number division. So if I take seven divided by two, I get three, right? No, 3.5 if I'm doing decimal, but here it's just whole numbers, so three. And so seven is represented by one, one, one. And if I shift down by one, well, I just get rid of the lowest one there or the lowest bit. Um, the rightmost bit, and so that leaves me with just one one. And of course, in the upper bit position, I have to substitute it with a zero because I started with a zero. Remember that caveat with the left, the right shift operator. And so now I go from seven to two to um to three, because one one is how you represent three in binary. Another example is if I were to shift three down by one, I get one because again. 
3 divided by 2 is just 1. Just by doing a shift once, shift right once. Now let's take a look at if we have negative numbers. Now here is how you represent the neg negative 4 in binary. Now I'm not going to worry talk about whose two's complements are any of that sort of stuff. You could look it up, but just trust me that um, this is what minus 4 would look like. Now notice, like I said, that upper or the most significant bit is a 1, and that indicates that this, we're dealing with a negative number here. And so if I shift it down by one bit again, we should ex expect to get minus 2. And as you can see, when I shift it down and get rid of one of those zeros on the right-hand side, I have to put a 1 still to maintain that how it was negative number that I was dealing with. And that is how you represent minus 2. So that is correct. Now let's just ask ourselves if it was to work the other way, if they didn't have this sort of caveat like I mentioned before. Let's just say I started with minus 4, and there's a, a 1 in the most significant bit position, far on the left, and I shift it down by 1. And instead of putting a 1, it put a 0. If it did that, when I do minus 4, sh right shift 1, that value, because it's 0, it's a positive number now. So I went from a negative 4 to 126. That doesn't seem right, right? If we divide it by 2, remember we say every time we remove a bit, we would divide by 2? Well, that would be wrong. So this is wrong, so let's cross that out. So now that we understand, hopefully, bit shifting, this prepares us to do some a little bit of magic using bit shifting to sort of make numbers and pull them apart. And you'll see what I mean. Let's say I have two, two bits value, and I want to combine those into a four-bit value, one four-bit value. How do I do it? So here is my first two-bit value. It's just simply two bits, and this has a decimal value of two, right? Because it's just two bits, one zero, and it's equivalent to the number two in decimal. I have a second two-bit value, zero, one, and its decimal value is one, right? So we're doing binary and decimal here. So the binary value is the gray, and decimal value is in that orange. Now I want to perform this operation of combining these two individual two-bit values to get one four-bit value. So what do we do? Well, we know that though if we take two and shift it up by two, it's going to insert zero, zero on the right-hand side. So that gives me four bits. And so here's my four-bit and the equivalent decimal value for that new thing now is 8, which makes sense because 2 shifted up once would be a multiplication by 2, which would be 4. 4 shifted up once more would be 8. So the result is 8. Let's apply the same thing now to the bottom bit, except I don't actually want to shift it up. I want it to stay where it is, but I'm going to represent it by a shift anyway. But remember, if I say I take 1, shift it up zero position, I'm essentially saying do not do anything to it. And so this is a legal expression, it just says don't move it. And so let's just say so now this gives us four bits, but because I did not change it, now remember all those leading zeros doesn't mean anything. What we really want to do now is just add these two values. And if I add these two, you know already that the answer is nine, right? So this is simply taking 8 plus 1, and you get a 9. And so what does 9 look like in binary? Well, you can see it there. If you look at those two sets of four bits that I have, and you imagine that how you add them up, where you add up the leftmost one, the right starting from the rightmost one, 0 and 1 is 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1 and 0, you get exactly this, 1, 0, 0, 1. And that is 9. You plug it into your calculator, your binary calculator, or you go on the web, or if you know to do conversion, this is 9. So we can see that this works out just fine. So I've taken two individual 2-bit value and combined them into a 4-bit value. Now, of course, I'll get a totally different number if I decided to do things the other way. If I had taken the first value, not shifted it up, which was the 2, right? Kept it as 2. And then I shifted up the 1 instead 2 times. And I would have gotten 1 shifted up once is 2. 2 shifted up another time is 4. And so my answer would have been 6 instead. But 
that is fine. We can do that if we want. It's all up to you which set of values you want to put first. Okay, so assuming you understand this, and if you don't, please replay it multiple times until you get it. Study it, pause, stay at it. So we left off where we tried to write an ash function that we were two of them. One that we just simply add all the, 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 we had the byte values in that string and it seemed to work okay. We had some collision. We tried to do exclusive or it was worse, but now we've just seen that we can take bits at a time, make integers, and maybe we can just take those integers and add them together. And maybe we'll be sort of a little bit better off than if we just add the individual bytes, because when we add an individual bytes, we only add in a bunch of eight bit values. So of course it's going to wrap around, but with bigger values, maybe we can be a little bit better. So let's see how we can do that. So let's call this, copy this and call it example four or exercise four. And so let's go to our main here. And so we're going to still read from the input, but now we want to change things a little bit. So why don't we just say, Let's iterate over string, and this is going to be in the, the index of that character before we were throwing it away. But this time, we sort of want to know what it is. Why? Because we're going to pick off four at a time. So we're going to create a new variable. Let's call it ss, for example. And we're going to say s is this. So if you think about what this means, it says from the beginning or from the zero position, I want you to take a subslice to slice the string and take off 0, 1, 2, and 3. But this is all you represented by putting the index of the last thing that where you want it to come up. If you don't know about slices and how to subslice, do check check out my Go Line for Tourists series that I posted. It's my full Udemy course, and I have a section on slices. I think it's, well, I don't know what ch chapter it is or section. But go go check that out, and I explain all this with pictures and everything, and show you what a slicing, um, what does this slicing thing do, and the offset and so on. All right, so now we have the first four bytes of s. So since we have the first four bytes, the next time we come around, we don't need the um, this four that we've already operated on. So what we really need to do is recalculate it such that x is the remaining set of bytes that we haven't touched yet. So in that case, s s is simply equals to s of four colon like this. What this means is start at offset four, but remember we ended at offset four here. So we start at offset four and we take the remainder of it. That's what this means. So now this is gonna allow us to start taking off, picking off four at a time. Well, okay, now that we have the four bytes in ss, now we can do our shift in magic. So what we can do is say, I want to have ss, of zero, which is going to be a rune, and I want to convert that to an integer value. Okay, once that's an integer value, I want to be able to shift it up 24 times. Then, what do we want to do once we have that? Well, we just want to add it to the same thing done to the next byte. So, we want to do ss of one shift it up 16 times plus int of ss of two shift it up eight times plus int of ss of three now and so now once we add these together we need to put them this value whatever this this big thing here is that's a value and what i want to do is put it in v but remember what we did before, we said that our v is equals to this, which means to keep adding values. Now, okay, now go is complaining somewhere. Okay, maybe not. My ID is just slow to update. So let's uh, open this up a little bit. And so now once I, oh, I don't actually need, um, oh, I do need um, i here. What I need i for is to say that how, um, I want i to be so long as i is equals to zero and i is less than the length of s divided by four and then i plus plus so 
what this is doing is saying let's take the length of that string that we're given and let's say it was our a through m that would be 13 so 13 divided by 4 is going to give us 3 all right remember this is just a simple division so it's going to give us 3 and we have one remainder but we we don't care about that and so what this means is go around this loop three times and pick out the first 12 characters now we really should put some logic after this for a loop to deal with any remaining character if it's the, the length of the string is divisible by four this for a loop is going to work great but if there's any remainder like one two or three we should take care of it all right and for now to keep this simple i'm going to ignore that we're going to deal with it eventually but for now i'm going to ignore it okay and so let's see if so we have um it says okay this is too small to be shifted up by 28 24 and that's that's okay so what we're going to do instead is say let's make our character value a int force and then shift it up and then we'll do the same thing here we'll make our character value an int force and then shift it up and make it an int force then shift it up and so basically what go is just complaining about is that yeah these values are pretty small and you want to shift them up by 28 you're going to um, cause an issue um, note it wasn't red it was just orange warning us that oh, basically we're going to lose um you know some bits but now by converting it first to an integer values those upper bits are going to be zeros because it doesn't actually change the actual value just the number of bits used to represent it and so now we can shift it up by 24 bits or whatever okay so that's fine and we don't have any complaint so any complaints from go so let's go back now and run our code well, we compile and run it so we're going to go to exercise four and we're going to do go run main and then we want to feed it our example which is going to be um, countries and maybe we should do this to sort it and see what, what we get and so notice oh we have much fewer um, collisions than what we did before so this is a much better function and so we can let's see i think we did like word conk like this so yep so certainly moving in the right direction so let's move on to exercise five where we try to do a slightly better job than what we were doing before let's um copy this and let's call it exercise five and so like i said right now we start throwing away some bytes if our string happen just happens to um not be a multiple of divisible by four and so the string length is not a multiple of four then we throw away some bytes so one way we can deal with this is to simply say well let's um say that so oh, we are breaking up these grouping by four right so we can say that oh we have a constant that's called let's call it our batches the, you know how, how many bytes we're taking how many bytes we're taking at a time and let's say that's four and so for let's loop over for i and b colon equals to range s we're going to loop over the entire range of s and i is going to be our index we can create a new index right let's call it idx a new index that is i modulus whatever our batches right which is in this case is four right and the reason i, I don't use a number four is because i might use four several times and maybe i might want to easily just change this from four to eight or something like that right and so this is our new index and this value i dx here is only going to be zero one two or three nothing else that's because while i is going to be able to range over the entire range of the string because we're doing the modulus operation this is going to be bounded between zero and one less than this so we, we cover that already okay now what do we want to do next well we don't actually want to do that what we can do is employ a switch statement and we can say switch on idx why switch on idx well we know the only cases we have to handle are the case when we have zero right and if we have zero that represents the very first byte in this group so if it's the very first byte in this group then 
That answer is very easy. It's just int of b, and that shifted up 24. And we just add that to v. And if it's the case when we have 1, then we know what that is. It's just the next byte in the, the second byte in a group at offset 1, so we just shift up by 16. And so you see, we can sort of play this game again. We can say, okay, when the offset is 2, well, it's the third byte in a group, which is at offset 2, but we only need to shift that guy up by 8. And just look back at our previous example to see that it is the first byte that I shift up by 24, the second byte by 16, the third by 8, and then the fourth byte, which is at offset 3, I don't shift it up at all. Okay? So definitely um, take a look at this. So this doesn't need to be shifted. And then we just sit on loop and we do this, which is essentially the same thing that we had before, except now we do not throw away any bytes at all. It doesn't matter what the length of the string is. All right. And then we return a value. And so now let's rerun our code and see if this is any better. So we're talking about example five now. And let's return this, rerun this. And we're not much better than before, right? We still... Um, now we are counting for all the values and so on, all the bytes, but we still um, have some collision. So there's some things that we can probably still do to sort of make sure to, well, not make sure, but minimize the possibility of collision. Now remember what I said, when you hash, you always have the risk of collision. So you, there are other things that you can do, but we're pre still pretty good. So let's move on to exercise six. So... One of the things, other things that we can do includes characters, alphanumeric characters, right? So it's going to be include the alphas and the numerics, right? So A through Z and maybe, um, and you know, the numbers. And so, or maybe we might want to limit it to just A through F, for example, and then um, zero, you know, through nine and then A through F. Um, all those things are in our discretion. And the way we can do this is by saying, let's make a dictionary, essentially, someplace where we can look up values. And so let's create a dictionary. And we say this is our, um, let's call it dictionary. And we're going to put some values in here. Let's put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then after this, it's going to be A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, again, we could continue and put, you know, all the way through Z if we wanted to. Now, because I'm going to be using the length of this dictionary often, I'm going to say that dictionary length is equals to the length of this dictionary. All right. And so those are the two variables that I've introduced. I'm still going to keep my main function the same way, which is written in a value from the user. And I'm going to keep this hash function. But what I'm going to do is write a second hash function and let's call it func hash2, which just takes a string and return. This time we're going to say it return a byte slice. Okay. And you'll see why I want to return a byte slice because that's easier because essentially we're returning as a string, but it's just easier for me to append to byte slices. And so what I'm going to do is say the value we're going to return is a slice of byte. That's V. And of course, I can say return V here. Let's save that. And so if I say H is equals to the hash of this string, so I reuse our previous hash function to get a number. This is just a number. And then now I can sort of loop over the hash value and each time I divide it. So what I can do then is take the large hash value that we get from our first function, which we saw was these, this large number here. And I could repeatedly divide these number by the length of my array. And if I do that, what I'm going to be able to do is take the modulus or the remainder of that division and use it as the index into my array. Does that make sense? So let me write it and show you what I mean. 
So what I can do is then say i is equals to zero and then for h is greater than zero. Only so long as h is greater than zero, I want i to be equals to h modulus of my dictionary length. And so then h is now equals to, if I divide this by the dictionary length. So what I'm doing is taking doing a division, getting the quotient, here I'm taking the remainder. Now, how do I use the remainder? And I say V is equals to append. Remember, this was a byte slice. Append to V. And so from my dictionary, I can use I. And so I'm going to pick out something from there, append it to V. And I keep going around until I've successfully divide down H, the hash value, that large hash value, until I've reduced it to zero. And then, of course, then I'm finished and I return. So that's my second hash function. But this guy hash, the first hash from a string to an int, the second hash from a string to a byte slice, which we can say is sort of like a string also. And so if I were to, let's say, include hash two in my output, so do the same exact same thing. And so now let's go back here and run it. So let's go to exercise six. So I'm gonna see two values. So let's just do um, this for now. And now you can see that I have, um, well, this is just a byte slice. Um, so let's change it to a string. So we can see what that is because it's harder to read as a slice of bytes. But there we go, this is what it looks like. And it's still gonna have the duplicates. The duplicates doesn't go away just because we introduce um, alphanumerics, you know, alphas into our thing. But this is just to show you that we can either have our hash value be a number or we can make it something sort of interesting. And because of how we did it, we can continue adding character here, like, you know, E, F, G, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. And so now if we rerun this, well, those are included also now in our hash value. So we can make even more interesting hash values. So we've written some code and we see it all, okay, well, we can take some string and hash that into some sort of numeric value. And it doesn't have to be numeric, like we can do things like use sort of like a lookup table and even um, turn those numeric value into alphanumeric values, right? Um, so there's no mystery there how to take a string, which could be very, very long, it could be even a whole file, and then make it something smaller that just represent the content that we feed as the input, right? So that's all hashing really is. But what I want to show you now is probably the quintessential example um, that you would come across when using hashing in like a computer science co um, course. And that would be for data storage um, and retrieval, fast lookup. Um, we're going to see in the next video that there's another way in which we can use hashing, and that is going to be in terms of say, talking about data integrity. And you can still use hashing in all these different ways, right? Um, so we're not going to write any more code, but it's to help you see some of the ways in which this can be useful. And so I figured, let me just sort of walk through this. Uh, why are we not writing any more code with the data storage part? It's because that's not really what we're focusing on here in this section, which is security. But since we have to talk about hashing, it makes sense to sort of show you, um, now that you've computed a hash, well, what else can you do with it? So let's say I have a large table with information on people and we have millions of entries, okay, millions of them. And, you know, there's people name, their data board, social security, and all that sort of stuff, address and contact information, right? And, you know, you can imagine all this sort of stuff like city and state and country and all this sort of stuff and phone number and everything else, right? So a lot of data points for one individual and I have millions of entries. Well, one of the ways I can store this information is by simply using an array if I want to quickly, you know, be able to pick up um, like an entry. And so we start off by trying to come up with some data structure to represent 
an entry and maybe we'll call this entry or person or something like that and this will be of course you know it's gonna have fields for the id and the person's name and data board and so on and so on this just represents how i store information for one individual like a struct but then i still need that array and um, let's say for now we're going to give this array the name ar and of course this array has to have enough entries or elements to store all of the records that I have. I remember I said there were millions of them. So that's the one e to the six there to just mean millions, okay? In this way of storing information, each element of my array is an entry or contains the information for one person. And so I'll have to scan the entire array if I want to find somebody and I don't know exactly where they are in this array. And that's assuming that oh, we don't do a one-to-one -one with their ID and the array because there's no more reason why you might not want to do that. If records are deleted, all that stuff, if the records and the IDs are not assigned sequential, then you really can't use the same ID to store things in your array. So that with, without that sort of tie into the two, the record and the entry in the, and the index in the array, then I have to search the entire array sometime at worst case to see if somebody's in there or to find someone. And if we look in specifically for Marianne here, then we have to, we don't know where, where in the area she could be. Maybe she's the first entry or maybe somewhere at the end uh, or in the middle, and we just have to just search. So another way we can do this is we can still use an array and we might want to use an array because arrays have some very nice benefits in terms of fast lookup. Once you know the, the location, you can just jump to that location, right? And you can um, read the information or store data there. But this time what we do is we still start with the entry. Remember, we still have to define what pieces of information we need to store about a person. So we still have that. And I've removed some of the fields for brevity. And we still need an array because we, we like the benefit that an array gives you. But if you look at my array now, it's significantly smaller than the array I was using before. Make no mistake, if I have millions of entries, I still will need millions of, of these objects, right? But for now, at least, my array that I'm starting with can be a little bit smaller, and you're gonna see why in a bit, because I'm gonna be using hashing. And as we said before, when you hash a value, even two different values might hash to the same result. And for that reason, we have to take care of collision, and I'll show you how we're gonna deal with collisions. And so the first thing I do is, if I wanna store an entry from into my array, what I'll do is I'll take that entry's name, like in this case, Marianne, run it through my hash function. I'll get a number, which I'll then feed to the modulus operator. Now, remember with a modulus operator, we give the number and we also have to give it the, basically the thing that we're modulating by. So in this case, um, it's going to be the length of our array. And what we're really saying is modulus operator, regardless of what number I give you, well, I just want you to return a number that is less than the length of the array. So that's going to be one less than the length of the arrow, which means that it is going to be bounded between the index of this array. So regardless of what value I hash, I'm always guaranteed that I'm going to get as the output from my modulus operator, some number that is the index that is a valid index in this array. Once I have this now, then I can say, you know what? I'm going to store Mary at this location. But remember, I can't really store Mary at this location because some other value could potentially hash to the same location. So what I do is at this location, I have maybe like a slice or a second array, and therefore I can store Mary and any other duplicates that are hashed to the same location in this second array. And so the end result is I still will have millions of these entry objects but that first array is much smaller and it's faster. And the thing is, not only is it fast to insert, but when it comes to looking up somebody, I can use their name, compute this hash, which shouldn't take a long time. And I can immediately jump to a location in that first array that I can then search to see if there's the entry is there. But notice when I have to search that secondary array, that secondary array is going to be much, much smaller. You know, it might be five entries, 10 entries, 100. Even if it's a 1,000, it's still much smaller than if I had to potentially scan 
millions of entries, okay? So that's one way in which hashing can be used. And this is sort of like the um, typical example you will you'll get when you first learn about hashing. Okay, um, that's it. Hope that you learned something. It might not seem that this really ties into security just yet, but wait for the next video and you I promise you, you'll see. Take care, thumbs up the video if you haven't already, subscribe if you haven't, hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I post these videos, and see you next time. Bye.